alert to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the Morning with Laura Styles and Rosenberg. Ebro in the Morning, Laura Styles, Rosenberg. We have friend of the show, uh, compadre, uh, our loved one who's on the front lines uh, from the Bronx, representing the BX, Tamika Mallory. What's happening, Tamika? Hey, Tamika. What's going on, family? Thanks for having me on. Actually, I was born and raised in Harlem. Yeah. Oh, man. Harlem yeah, yeah. Moved <laughs> to the Bronx. So it's wait, all wait, over what her do you think? Harlem or the Bronx? Pick one. She's Harlem, man. Yeah, Harlem. <laughs> Harlem. I live in the Bronx, but I'm a Harlem girl. Where, what, where exactly were you from, Tamika, in Harlem? Um, I lived in a place called Manhattanville Projects. Which is... Uh, or housing development. It's on 126th Street and Old Broadway. I live more on 133rd and Old Broadway. Got it. So on, on the front side was all the black folks, and behind my building was where all of the Latinos live. So I was right in the middle. El Barrio and the black neighborhood, where it came together. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Now, Tamika also has an organization, Until Freedom, which has... Uh, Taking up residence, I believe you guys are down in Louisville, Kentucky. Yes, on the front exactly. lines of the Breonna Taylor um, case and murder, and holding that city attorney general of the state, uh, local police accountable. Um, you know, this is a uh, this is unprecedented. I think in some in many ways for you know you guys to go on and just move everyone down there to stay on the ground. Oftentimes, you guys fly back and forth and you're moving around right. the nation. Why did you guys make this move? Well, you know, it, it is, uh, so it's not something that people do often. One, because folks in this work can't always afford to go and move uh, to other cities. I think the last time we saw something like this may have been in Ferguson, where people from across the country did go staying in churches, sleeping on floors, doing whatever they had to do to be a part of the Mike Brown uh, uprising. Uh, how, but I think the last time that I remember something uh, very similar to this is when Dr. King moved to Chicago in the midst of the civil rights movement in the 60s. Um, and it was a real tough time for him being on the ground, dealing with local politics, all the stuff that we have to deal with while we're here. Um, the reason why we decided to come is because as you have seen, you know, we have these really big moments, the march in Frankfurt where Jada Pinkett and others uh, came and, and, and was with us. Rhapsody Common was there. I mean, the list goes on of uh, incredible influencers that came out to uh, to rally with us. And then we left. And of course, the people here locally keep doing their thing. They've been on the streets for, you know, many days. I think it's over 80 days now that they've been protesting and organizing around Breonna Taylor. But you wouldn't know about it because the media purposely uh, ignores local leaders and, and local movements. Um, and, and then we came back and we had the Louisville 87, which was a group of us that got arrested on Daniel Cameron, the, the attorney general, uh, his lawn. And so that was another important moment where a mixture of local folks and people like Portia Williams and uh, Yandy Smith Harris and YB Corday and Trade of Truth and, you know, list goes on there too. Kenny Stills um, were arrested together. And that was another high moment. And then, of course, it goes back to the same thing where the local people are out here, you know, fighting like hell and not necessarily getting the attention that we sort of bring when we all do things together. So we decided that if we come here and we stay, we can help to keep that momentum high um, and, to, and to create these moments, but then not have them die down because we're trying to organize on the cell phone and on Zoom calls from New York City. It doesn't work like that. So we've been, we've been implanted. And I think the other thing, uh, family, that's important is that we're not just here uh, doing protests, which is definitely a part of our work. It's the community action is a part of our work. But we also have been doing community service projects. Last Saturday, we get, we had a farmer's market in conjunction with the Urban League here, the local Urban League, and we gave out uh, 2,000 boxes of produce. We went door to door, uh, you know, delivering produce to families that couldn't come out to m grandmothers, big mamas, as we say, that are immobile. Um, you know, we've been meeting with local 
local community, uh, having dinners and other events where we bring together local organizers, some who sit together all the time, some who don't, who are never at the table. And I, f- I feel like we have, we have, we have SNCC at the table. Um, you know, we have Dr. King at the table. We've got all the different personalities in the movement coming together to meet. And so what we're doing is trying to uh, build capacity and build movements across this country that um, that that are sustained and not not take away from a community when we go into it, but to deposit, to bring with us. Well, and things. also to stabilize, right, and and create Absolutely. a system that can 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 maintain itself, and also right. is funded, also right, because that's the other part where right. you have people doing this work day in and day out. Uh, it Absolutely. requires resources to keep that energy. Absolutely. And, you know, we always have to be careful when we talk about local communities because it's important for people to know they were feeding folks already. You know, they were doing a lot of this work on the ground here already. And I think we've been able to help by bringing additional resources. And look, we all know we get tired in New York City as a as a local person from New York, right? I'm a local New York activist. There are moments when we need the infusion of energy, people coming in and waking us up and helping us out. You know, people get tired. And so, yes, we are trying to create a sustainable movement here. And ultimately our goal, because because trust me, not everybody likes the fact that we're here, even some people who look like us. And we've had to have serious conversations in which we've said, we're here for Breonna Taylor and her family. They want us here. They work with us every day. They invited us to be here. Um, and we become an extension of their movement as well. And so we just have to all find space for one another. And the majority of people have been you know, really welcoming where, um, but where, to your point about that, Tamika, that, just just uh, sorry to cut you off, but I wanted to focus on that because there's always some dissension, right? That always happens, always. and you've always. seen it. Um, I've been a part of conversations around it uh, and trying to navigate past it. Um, when when that happens, is that mostly driven by ego and fear of people thinking you're trying to take from them versus uh, help uplift and support? I think you've got a, a few things. You've got, uh, you definitely have ego, of course. We all have a little bit of it. You know, Ebro, we all got a little bit of ego. That's right. Oh, <laughs> so, you got bars now? You got bars? <laughs> so, you know, we, 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 we all deal with that. Um, there's also an issue with resources. And people feel like how you come to my local community and then people are donating to you. And yet we need resources to be directed here locally. So what's going to happen with that dollar that someone gave you? Are you going to give 50 cents to this community? And we are, we work on that. We give money to local groups. We ask funders to, I mean, we have a major proposal that we just sent to a funder, which includes the names of local groups that they can help. So we understand clearly that the resources have to be a flow through. And people will tell you that we have given some of the monies that was donated to us, to this local community. We've done that across the country in Minneapolis and other places. So scarcity becomes a part of uh, the conversation. Some folks, you know, really just want to, they want us to know that you actually care about this community and that you're not just using it for a photo op. So you have that as well. But then you got the COINTEL Pro folks who are people who are literally at the table to disrupt. So anytime someone tries to do something positive, they're going to start coming up with reasons why the people can't be trusted. Right. You know, we ought to push back because their job is to try to cause dissension so that people can't come together. And so that's why on Tuesdays we meet uh, in the basement of a church with organizers this Tuesday, you know, we had an emotional conversation where people were giving feedback locally and we as an organization um, were giving our feedback and we left there in love and peace. Um, And so that this is something that we learned, right? When we watched uh, King in the Wilderness and other documentaries and movies about Dr. King, what we know is they had kitchen conversations where Ralph Abernathy uh, and and others, uh, Stokely Carmichael, they didn't, they were, they were in, they had, they had tension. There was tension among them, but they still got out there and got on the front line together. I think about 
uh, really quickly in the in the film King in the Wilderness, which people should watch. It is a very so good, good documentary. Yes, that that talks about Dr. King in the last days of his life um, and how depressed he was and lonely and all that he was going through. But there's this one scene where Dr. King and Stokely Carmichael are marching together. And the reporter is talking to Dr. King about the movement. And Dr. King says, you know, nonviolence, you know, we've got to stay focused on our target. We can't allow violence into our movement. And then he turns, the, the reporter turns to Stokely Carmichael and says, and so what do you think nonviolence? He says, we need to burn this damn thing down, right? <laughs> and, and, and so they've got two well, different- yeah, that's right. They've got two different I ideologies, but at the same time, they were it at the same march walking together towards a goal. And I think that's what we, we have to take um, our cue from that, because that is how they were able to actually get things like the Civil Rights Act passed voting rights. That's how they did real things. They didn't always agree, but they knew that they, they were all needed. It was all necessary. So when Bill Clinton says something like, well, you know, John Lewis, uh, you know, was somehow better than Kwame Ture, what made the, the movement and Black folks who understand the danger of what he was saying, what made people so upset is that you can't discredit any of our leaders. You can't discredit what the Black Panthers were doing because they are needed, just like you have in fact that is out here right now. These brothers and sisters are showing up, walking legislators who uh, are under attack. You know, I think they walked a Black woman uh, who was under attack in one of these states. Uh, she was going to work and they walked her to work with their own weapons because there were there were white supremacists outside of the, the state house with, with their guns. That was and so, you know, you can say, well, we don't want this to be a movement about weapons, but if other people have them, we might, we need some too. We need protection as well. So, it you know, and, and of course it doesn't mean anybody wants to see people kill one another, but we're being killed. And so that part of the movement, you might not see us out there. You will probably never see us out in, in you know, in our marches, armed and weapons. But I'm not going to take anything away from other in other organizations and individuals who may um, bear arms to to be out there and handle things in, in their in their in their way. And we hope that all of it stays nonviolent. But I think that it's important for us to understand that we are not the ones creating the violence. The violence is being done towards us. So right. that's that's you know that, that's what I would say. The tension is just is what it is and we just been dealing with it and we have to continue to can do I, so. um, I don't think I'm oh. oh, sorry Laura. I just don't think that people realize how like everything that you guys go through besides all the work that you do, like on your Twitter page, you share that since being in Louisville, helicopters, unmarked, unmarked cars have been following you guys around, even at your homes. Mm. I, I just don't understand how because of everything we've seen how capable what these people are capable of. You know I mean, how do you guys I don't know how you guys handle that? Who protects you guys? How do you make sure that that nothing's going to happen to you? Because we've seen you guys get arrested over and over and over again. And, yeah. and, and you know, I, I support and, and, and I love the work that you are doing. It's so necessary because we need somebody else to fight. But I just when I see your tweets like that, it, it's so scary to me. And I just, you know, yeah. I commend you guys so much for staying strong. But who, who watches over you? Well, first of all, um, you know, we have we we have we have committed ourselves understanding that our truth is death is possible and that's death or you know or harm is possible that is that's the oath sort of you take with other individuals that you are out here with right and what makes until freedom incredible is that we've particularly as the four co-founders, my son, uh, Linda and Angelo, uh, together, the four of us, we've committed that we will die for one another like that. So in an instant, we will give our lives to protect another one of, 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 of our you know, colleagues. And we have a bunch of other people who have joined us here in Kentucky that are from across the country. We have people from St. from St. Louis, people who were on the ground during the Ferguson uprising. We have people, uh, the one of the women uh, who was a leader in the George Floyd movement that we saw happening in Minneapolis. 
We have uh, folks from Atlanta fighting for Rayshard Brooks and other cases there. And the list goes on of uh, 25 leaders from across the country who have come together to take residency here in Kentucky. Um, and, 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 and we all understand, we understood when we came here that anything, this is Kentucky, right? Like anything can happen. It's, this is not New York, which that doesn't mean that, you know, things don't happen there, but we know where we are. We understand the history. Um, so we've taken that oath, but we are, we do have security. And um, I, you know, I tell people all the time because I get these little trolling messages from folks when I'm on live and on my socials and they say, oh, do you guys have security? And I tell them all the time, I wouldn't roll up around us and try to find out. It's not a good idea for you. So I think because one thing that my son is going to ensure is that Linda and I are protected. So the security that we roll with is deep. Uh, we can't protect from the officers or some, or some, you know, whatever, some, some other force uh, uh, taking us out, blowing up our house. Sh you know, these things can happen, but we are well protected. Uh, there's, there are folks around at all times, 24 hours a day. And to your point, Ebro, that costs money. And I have to give a shout out to Rock Nation and Jay-Z and Desiree because they have put their money where their mouths are in terms of supporting us and helping us while we're on the ground. And one of the biggest things that Jay has said that he cares about is our security. And so he's very invested in making sure that we have people here with us all the time. So can I ask you a question about the goal here in in Kentucky, is it as simple as if Daniel Cameron, the attorney general, were were willing to go after this properly, like that could do the job? Um, or is it more complex than that? And if and if that is the case, and if and I believe mm -hmm. Tamika, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a Democratic governor, like what is the problem here? Why can't this dude, Daniel Cameron, do the right thing? Is he just trying to kiss Trump's ass? Like what is going on? Or and go deeper into the police union and the history of Louisville and that oppressive police department too. Right. So just to touch on the surface, uh, Ebro of the of the history, when you look at the police report, right from this case, just this case, I won't even go into stuff I've learned about other cases here. Just this case, the police report literally says from that night where Breonna Taylor was killed, there were no injuries. How, how we're, we're still trying to figure out how a police report could say no injuries when a woman's body was riddled with bullets, right? Right. Um, there are a whole bunch of other things on the report. Then the way in which they got the no-knock warrant, which is at the center of how Breonna Taylor was killed, that there was a, a no-knock warrant uh, that the police lied to get Joshua James to be exact, lied on the application to the judge by saying that there were drugs in Breonna Taylor's home or that packages were being delivered to her home that were suspicious, in which the post office said they never reported such a thing. This was a lie that was made up in order to get the no-knock warrant because they were on their fishing expedition and couldn't do real police work. They had to go terrorizing folks, trying to find the drugs that they claimed this other dude had. The th reason why I bring those things up is because I think one of the reasons why those officers who killed Breonna Taylor were not fired immediately is because it would open up a can of worms about how they have been doing this over and over. This is not a new thing. This the lying on the police report, filling out a report that, that just says, you know, there's no injuries that, you know, that, uh, going in line to get applications. This is probably behavior that they participate in all the time. And so if you fire them, then you might have a situation where they those officers in their own defense will turn around and say, hey, we've been doing this. Let me tell you about what chief told me on X day. Let's pull back the onion and let's blow the whistle on how this operation has been, uh, you know, going forward for many, many, many years. Some of these folks have been officers a long, long time. So I think they have an issue where they're trying to figure out how do we do what we know has to be done without blowing the whistle on an operation a criminal operation that operation that's been taking place in this city 
So I think that's one. I think that's why the mayor and the police chief did not just go ahead and fire these officers. And if you notice, what instead happened is that the police chief, who was already talking about retiring, they made an announcement that he was resigning, which he actually re he retired a little early. But why did he go? What was the reason that he went? Because you know what? Again, if you pull back the layers, he probably has been a part of the corruption within the LMPD. So now you talk about Daniel Cameron, who at this, you know, has the responsibility, he has the case, he should be able to independently bring charges against these officers. Mm -hmm. um, he's a Trump loving supporter. I mean, that's it. He, he stood on a stage and said, that uh, 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 Rosenberg, he stood on the stage and said, it, he was at a Trump rally, he was speaking, and he said, we're gonna make Kentucky Trump land. That was his words. So, you know, I, I, this administration is supposed to be the law and order administration where they're telling you, uh, Barr, William Barr, who's the acting attorney general, he, he's actually stood before America and said, if people don't start respecting police officers, we're going, we may stop policing your communities. I mean, these folks are blatantly disrespectful. They're blatantly racist. And if Daniel Cameron wants to be in their good graces, he does not want to uh, indict four officers in a high profile case that everyone is watching where he probably is getting major pushback because of, you know, of, of whatever their theories are about why it's okay to kill a black woman. That's well, my answer. Well, and then to go deeper, and this is something that I think, you know, um, the issue in uh, Alameda County Sheriff, Masai mm. Ujuri, who was mm. the general manager president of Toronto Raptors, who the story came out now, there's camera footage of him being pushed by the sheriff and mm. him not exhibiting any aggression as he showed his pass after a championship game. I bring that up because in the media, a lot of these stories do not go as far as they need to because media outlets oftentimes do not want to lose their access to politicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't want to lose their mm -hmm. access to the police department to get stories done and be in good graces with these institutions that have exhibited racism and racist behavior and oppressive behavior time and time again. But when you work for an outlet, so down there in Louisville, Kentucky, you have this attorney general who I, I would assume, Tamika, is probably not getting the pressure from the local media. Mm -hmm. And is not get yeah. and the police department are they getting the pressure from the local media? I think that the local media has been covering the story, but I think it's to your point they're just covering the details. I don't think that anybody is is everywhere he goes, the media is showing up saying yo like Breonna Taylor. I don't think that that's the case. I I, I know that they that the governor has been pressed often. Uh, but Daniel Cameron, and and you know what? The other thing is, it's COVID. So things are just not as you would expect. Like we would more than likely be bird dogging him where the media would be with us everywhere he show, goes, we would be there. But since people are at home Zooming, unless you sit outside his house all day long, you might not even be able to get an opportunity to speak to, to him. him. And so to I think, right. you know, it's a mixture. It's a mixture. Yeah. And so what can be done, essentially? All this work, time, effort, risk, money that you guys are putting in, what could happen in a perfect, obviously nothing's a perfect world at this point, but from here moving forward, what would be for Tamika Mallory, what would be the, the, the route that this could go to getting justice for Breonna Taylor's family? Yeah, I think we're getting closer, Rosenberg. I think something is about to happen. Um, you can feel it in the air here. And people who are political insiders in the city believe that an announcement is coming. See, one of the biggest issues that they have right now is the Kentucky Derby is coming up. And there are many people locally are saying they're going to organize to disrupt the Derby. Um, you know, the, I'm, I've been told that they're bringing in additional police. Like, I, And I think you all saw that they're bringing they're having all police officers. Can't even take vacation. Back. 
All work day. Come back from vacation. If you, you're off for some reason. You had a baby, whatever it is, you got to come back to work on this Tuesday coming, uh, August 25th, because we're having a march. So just our march, our little march, where, again, only 87 of us were arrested at Daniel Cameron's house. They are, they are bringing all their force to, to, to silence us and to fight us. They also have new rules here where you're not supposed to be able to march in the street. And so what we saw when we first got to town, first two days we were here, we went out marching with the young people and they were literally boxing around them like offices parked all around, picking people off the street, like, you know, arresting young folks who were out there who stepped off the sidewalk. Well, we were in the middle of the street, but, you know, we were never on the sidewalk, but that was their, their thing. Now, mind you, and I know I'm going off the point, but this is important. A three-year-old child was killed with her father in the car um, that we went and visited with her family uh, since we've been here. 29 people have been shot and killed, and I think the number has gone up in the last month. This is why we say defund the police, because they're spending their resources putting helicopters over us as nonviolent protesters, uh, having unmarked cars with us, being at protests. Uh, barricading off streets with police cars and people in riot gear and all of that. Meanwhile, in the communities, there's other issues happening where there's violence and other things, and they're not there. They come after you, call, after the situation has happened. Police officers show up and, and maybe take a report and keep it moving. They have all of this money to do things, to, to focus on protesters and trying to silence people from being uh, righteously angry at what is happening instead of doing real police work to help communities figure out ways to bring down tension. Um, and so that's why we say defund the police. But to go back to your point about what would be a, a, a perfect situation, I believe that, I think that the, the best thing that can happen at this point is the indictment, of course, that's what we want. But if for some reason, Daniel Cameron is not gonna indict, I've been saying, stop being a punk, show your hand. Show your hand, put your cards on the table. They don't want to deal with what is going to happen at Kentucky Derby if they don't do something, right? So if they don't make an announcement, people will probably march in mass numbers here. If they do make an announcement and it's not the right announcement, then they still have the same issue. So I think that they're trying to figure out how to drag this along as, as much as possible. And they started implementing these rules about not being able to march in the street, bringing offices back to intimidate people to try to keep that because that Kentucky Derby, as you know, that's a money maker. That's a big money maker in this city. So and they're I still think having 20,000 people go there. They're not doing the full 150,000, but I know it's 20,000 right. spectators. Right. That's what they say. So, you know. It these, could still be a big folks. scene. Of course. It can still, of course. Big of scene. Course. Of now, course. Now, Tamika, um, with that energy that's outside and has been outside all around the country um, in many forms of protest um, and, and demonstration, uh, clearly, um, now you have somebody like Kamala Harris, uh, who is a, the official uh, vice president nominee under Joe Biden. You have Joe Biden. Uh, do you believe these two individuals um, care to listen and want to actually uh, enact uh, more progressive change if they're to get the job? Yeah, I think that um, I think you 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 hit it right on the head. Care to listen. If you if right now something happens right to you, Ebro, whatever, and we feel that it rises to the level of trying to contact, you know, let's just say you were arrested wrongfully and we felt it rise to, rises to the level of contacting the attorney general's office or we need an fbi investigation who do you call i you know other than i know van jones and them have a way of being able to get the administration to focus so that's great um you know they've been getting people released and we have to make sure we always acknowledge that work because it's important work 
But most of us have nobody to call in this White House that has a soul to even listen to your concerns. Well, but and also There's... specifically when it ties to corrupt policing and the institution Absolutely. of racism and in policing in and specifically with government employees, people paid oh, by the state. Oh, please. There's no there's no one to call. OK, now what I would assume, what I believe I know is that the people around Kamala Harris and Joe Biden are individuals who do have a soul. Right. And Kamala and, 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 and Joe Biden themselves, that you can at least get somebody on the phone to argue with. You can find somebody in that administration to say, hey, Ebro's locked up. This is what's going on. We need some help. And you don't got to call Kim Kardashian to get it done. You can actually find somebody at the White House if they I would I'm, I'm saying I'm think I'm talking as if they have been elected that you right. can talk to. The question we have to ask ourselves and what we have to say, especially as activists, is we're going to have to fight whoever it is that's in the White House because nobody is going to make radical shifts um, in, in with systems that are archaic, that were designed to oppress us. Like anybody that you put in, you could put your grandmother, who is the most beautiful woman ever, in, in the presidency, who has the best intentions, and still, because of the way that these systems operate, there's going to be problems. You're not going to get everything that you want because this is America and so much has been, pre, it's been pre-designed. However, we have to ask ourselves, who do we want to fight? Do we want to fight Trump who could care less about anything that we're saying? Do we want to fight an administration with Michael Pence and, and William Barr and others who have shown us that they are these people are taking the mailboxes up off the ground? OK, they are committing. I just somebody just showed me the other day the absentee ballots are going out with a picture of Donald Trump on the absentee ballot. OK, this is this is this is voter That's suppression. Criminal. And yeah, it's criminal. Voter They're stealing. Fraud. Exactly. They're stealing. So do you want to fight them who I believe are soulless individuals or would you, I just saw the other day that the two, the couple that was on their lawn with their guns drawn yep. on protesters yep. in St. Louis, of which our friend who's with us here in Kentucky, Tory Russell, he led the uh, the Ferguson uprising. Um, he, he, he was there. They had guns drawn on them and they have been invited to speak at the Republican National oh, yeah. Convention. Oh yeah. So I think I would prefer to fight Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. That's just my, I, that's what I think. I don't want to fight Donald Trump. I'm tired of Donald. I don't want to even see Donald Trump anymore. He is not, as Michelle Obama said, he is not the president that this country needs. I mean, I've said for many years now that we've been in this, but he is the president that America deserves based on Absolutely. the systems that you just talked about and based on based on the corruption that has been at the federal and state and local level, as well as the police and the fact that there has not been accountability. And I'll say in this conversation, like I've said also many times, if Kamala, Joe, and whoever's going to get this job do not in some way convict Donald Trump and this whole thing that's going on, it will come back again into power. Mm -hmm. It will if it's not held accountable. This is a problem. America has a problem because now you got straight straight conspiracy theorists, nut jobs winning, winning uh, uh, that are that are aligned with racist organizations and racism that are winning primaries in Florida and Georgia. Absolutely. This is a real this is a real thing. And if you want and they're if, appointing and they're and they are appointing judges left and right, even in this pandemic, they have appointed judges across the country, federal judges. I'm like, yo, so there, there are a lot of a lot of black men who say to me, well, it doesn't impact me. It doesn't matter who the president is. We still, you know, going through, which is true. There's trauma no matter what. 
But I'm thinking to myself, let me show you where the rubber meets the road. Those courts, federal courts, that's where our people are going. Okay. Yep. Forget if you if you say Supreme Court is a different conversation, that doesn't impact me. I don't want okay, cool. The federal courts is where our people go as they get felonies and go to jail for X amount of time for the same crimes that are being committed by people from white folks. And, and, and they end up doing more time. Our people have more felonies. And then of course the laws are written where felons can't do this, 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 and this. I mean, I, there's a campaign uh, in, and you know, uh, uh, Carmen Perez and, and Jay oh, yeah. Jordan um, in, in, in California working on um, a, a campaign called Time Done where Jay speaks of all the restrictions that convicted felons have just in the state of California. You can't be a dog walker. You can't have your license to be a barber. I mean, these things, so so it's all connected. If you feel like the system is oppressing you and yet they're putting federal judges in place that can give you a felony and then that felony is backed up by the system. Well, then, you know, when you try to go back to society and get your life together, you're dealing with the oppression that starts with the same judge that gave you the felony in the first place. I mean, this is this is real serious stuff. And so this is not the time, y'all. Um, you know, I'm saying this to the audience. I'm saying this to all of us who may feel like they want to play around with Kanye West right now. People who, you know, this is not the time. We we have a serious problem, as you said, Ebro, and we got we have to get our people organized because guess what? As they do this whole thing with the post office. Uh, defunding the post office and and trying to stop mail-in ballots. Um, and, and as we are dealing with COVID, we have to remember, this is really, really important, that the population impacted by COVID for us, for Black folks, where we know it has been, and, and, and Latino people, where we know that it has disproportionately impacted us, that is the most committed voting block of the Democratic Party. These older folks who get together from senior centers and get on their, their vans and they get out there, those are the ones that you can depend on. And right now they are being disenfranchised and voter suppression is hurting that population because they are afraid to go to law in large crowds. They cannot really come out of their homes. They are they're not gonna stand on lines all day. We're in Kentucky where I am right now in the last uh, uh, primary election. You had a situation happen here where they closed down all the polling places and left one open that had to cover 600,000 people. And of course, a lot of that number were black folks. And there are there's video online, don't listen to me, check it yourself, where you see people outside banging, banging on, on the, the doors trying to get Because they closed the doors in. and they had people they waiting in the cars for hours. Yep. For, exactly. So you had, so you know, Michelle Obama said, bring your dinner your lunch, your snack, everything with you and be prepared to stay online for all day and night if you have to, because we have to vote. But that, but some of our elderly people are not going to be able to do that. And those are the people that the Democratic Party has been depending on. And so we've got a problem where we as younger, able-bodied individuals have to figure out how we're going to get the mail-in ballots done help help our folks get their mail-in ballots done and then get it to the post office, not just the corner post box, because that's gone in some communities. And in others, they put boots on it, if you will, to lock them. So now it has to get to the actual post office. Well, guess what? When we were giving out 2,000 boxes of, of produce here, there were many people who cannot go. They they are immobile. Do you you are y'all understand what I'm saying? They can't go to the post office. They couldn't come pick up the produce. We had to bring it to them. So there's real work to be done. So we can sit around and talk and 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 have folks debating Kanye, debating this, debating that, and lose this election. And as Michelle Obama said, I think her speech was the best of all of this. Me too. Um, as as she said, if you think it can't get worse. It can. It can. Tamika Mallory, ladies and gentlemen, uh, next, uh, I believe it's uh, next Tuesday, Day of Action, Good Trouble Tuesday, gathering at South Central Park um, out there in Louisville. All hands on deck for that um, next Tuesday. Um, 
Yeah, what? and it, it, it actually is the end of something called Brianna Khan, um, where we focus on Brianna's law, you know, banning no-knock warrants across the entire state of Kentucky. It's been done in Louisville uh, at uh, Katora from, from the ACLU and Representative Attica Scott and so many people have to always make sure that, you know, we mentioned the people who've done the work here locally. Uh, they were able to get no-knock warrants banned just in Louisville and now they're working on Kentucky, but it also has been introduced in, I think, Pennsylvania yesterday. Uh, Virginia's looking to ban no-knock warrants. Uh, I know folks in Georgia are trying, they, they did do some version of it and they're looking to ensure that no knock warrants is no more thing there. So this Brianna Khan is gonna focus on bringing attention to Brianna's law. We have policy panels, Trayvon Martin mother's gonna be here. Uh, George Floyd's family will be here standing with the family of, of, uh, of um, uh, Brianna Taylor, of course, Ben Crump and you know, the list goes on of people who are flying in. There's empowerment events, Gandy Smith Harris and Portia will be down here. Uh, Trade of Truth and my son and, and Rhapsody will be doing a concert for young folks at what we're calling a BreeBQ, where we're honoring all the, the fallen victims. Um, and then of course on Tuesday, we're gonna march and that's, that's the thing that the police are are really concerned about. So just like they have all hands on deck, uh, we need to have all hands on deck and people who are in the Louisville area, uh, anywhere in the surrounding cities, we ask that you step outside of your fears and your comfort zones and get here and stand with us. Don't leave us out here alone. Um, do you guys, uh, until freedom, um, if people want to donate to your org um, so that you guys can help distribute resources down there in Louisville locally, uh, what? How do how do we go about doing that? You can go to untilfreedom.com. That's untilfreedom.com. A lot of folks like to give at ca on Cash App, so we're dollar sign Until Freedom. Of course, Venmo. We're at Until Freedom, but we prefer that people go to the website and give directly uh, through our site at untilfreedom.com. It's safer. It's more secure. Tamika, thank you for joining us today. Um, and it's great to see you. Um, and always let us know any way we could continue to support. Um, thank you. We love y'all so much and appreciate everything. You guys are are, are the fighting radio people. We <laughs> hear y'all debating and bringing issues uh, to the forefront. So thank you so much for the support and the love. And Ebro, I got to hit you later because I need help getting to Washington D.C. with all of these people for the. March on Washington. Yeah, so. let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. All right. Thanks, Love y'all. Thank Love you. Too. Bye.